I'm really delighted to uh, be here today, and I apologize for not doing this in my lab. Um, and so as a consolation, sort of, I will talk about fossils, and I actually brought uh, the world's second oldest bird here for you, one of them, to, for you to see. I'm going to talk about um, phylogeny. I'm going to concentrate on morphology because I think that's the real theoretical frontier, what we really have to sort out. Uh, and what I think we're going to sort out in the next decade, some new methodologies to try to uh, grapple with, um, with trying to understand morphology in a phylogenetic perspective. Darwin took us a long way there. But it's what we would call, uh, what, what the philosophies of, uh, philosophers of, of history have called narrative. That's what Darwin really, in a beautiful and elegant way, took us in, in phylogenetic uh, theory. And we've seen several things since then. And uh, what I'd like to do is try and take you through a little bit of that. And some of it is new in the sense that I've published it fairly recently. And so if you have input, critique, otherwise, I'd be delighted. Um, for a long time, phylogenetic trees were the restricted domain of bearded professors arguing about the significance of the porpoise's left thumb or whatever. With the advent of molecular data and the growth of computing power, scientists have become very interested in them once again. Matthew Cobb, I hope, is not in the audience, but there's so many things I object to in reading that. <laughs> not only because I can't grow a beard and I'm interested in evolution, but um, actually, Morphologists, including Darwin, as we saw in the last talk, an incredible naturalist, and others during his day, really invented uh, the study of phylogeny and a lot of the terms that we use to study any kind of data, molecular or morphological. But if you have a molecular tree and you're not actually interested in the molecules themselves, and a lot of molecular systematists aren't, then you don't have a lot to talk about if all you have is the tree and you have no way of putting the morphology on it. So it's a combined problem. We have to be able to chart the morphology. As it turns out, when we work on molecules and we work on morphology, we often find a consilience, an amazing consilience. And when we don't, and we're working on fossils, well, it's amazing. My phylogenies are perfect. And their phylogenies for about the first half of life, single cell life, are also perfect. There's no problem with the fossil record. We're happy. And where we cover, when we come together, we're often consilient. But the DNA, I would argue, at least sequence data on the surface of things, is a lot easier to interpret. You go into the literature, and you don't find people typically arguing about A, T, C, and G. They agree what these things are. And when you go to the morphology, you find a different, as interesting as it is, and I think it is very interesting, you find a very different sort of setup. Now, if we look at um, Darwin's origin of species, of course, there's a famous notebook B in which he produced this branching diagram, which is allegedly you know, the first phylogenetic tree. And uh, then in his origin of species, stunning in the fact that it has one figure, a man who produces monographs, a man who produced a beautiful tome called The Descent of Man with some 70 or 80 figures, put this figure, it's the only figure in the origin of species, which is amazing. It is amazing. Now, it also is one of the first phylogenetic trees that we have, and it's, a, it's really a, a, a great example. Now, people did branching diagrams before. They just weren't interpreted as phylogenetic trees. There were diagrams for the natural system. And in fact, uh, in some cases, there were diagrams of the force of God or some external power forcing things along different branches because Darwin, of course, was not the first evolutionist. There were trees, actually literally trees, that followed, the most famous being Heckel. Here's a couple from Heckel's uh, in the 1860s. And we would largely agree that for much of life, a divergent tree is a good metaphor. Um, when we look at the largest scale of life, however, and you go down to the base, Lateral gene transfer complicates things, perhaps frequently, so that a, 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 a diametric, you know, a, a, a bifurcating, a directional bifurcating tree is not the only model. In fact, for the base of life, it may not be the best model for what's actually going on. Now, um, tree 
thinking is a term that the philosopher of history, Robert O'Hara, has used for what Darwin was trying to instill. He talked about trees. He talked about the tree of life with capital letters as a metaphor. And tree thinking is something that actually, for whatever reason, and there's been a lot of discussion as to why, doesn't come as natural to us as ladder thinking, scale of life, scale of being thinking. A tree is actually a complicated structure. It's branching and it arborizes. It's easier to think in terms of a ladder. It's also easier to think in static terms about the evolution of x than the evolution of x from y. But it's really important to think in terms of transformation when we talk about evolution, because that's really what evolution is. It's a transformation from one state to another. So many examples would suffice. Why flamingos are pink is an example. Uh, brought up in the, in the case of some of these, these papers. You know, is that the real question? Or is when you look slightly broader and you see that there's some whitish flamingos, is it that they were once pink and they're, they're now white, or they were white and they're now pink? Uh, how many birds outside? Is that a primitive color? Is that a derived color? The question begs a comparative uh, 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 setup to, to, to be able to answer. Now, um, so recently, and I, I am really impressed by this, the last 10 years or so, uh, the philosophy of history has been applied to the early part of phylo phylogenetic thinking in evolutionary biology rather than the philosophy of science as, uh, because much of what we're trying to do is very analogous to trying to, to chart the history of life. Um, and let me go back. In the philosophy of history, they, they differentiate chronicle from narrative. Chronicle would be a series of events where you as the historian remove yourself as much as possible and are simply describing the sequence of events versus a narrative which is causally relating those events. And those things were not so easily differentiated for much of the 19th century. And they were really sort of combined uh, pretty much together. Uh, explaining the past was easy because you'd look back you knew what happened. It was a matter of explaining why. And there were a lot of what if proposals during the 19th century. But how would that be testable? How would it be scientific? This was not clear. Darwin himself was quite conservative. You read through The Origin of Species, he does talk about groups. He talks about groups in his barnacle monograph. But he's pretty conservative. He doesn't stick out his neck very far. We'll talk in generalities. But he was actually quite conservative. And what he said as a prediction at several points in the book, but very eloquently, is that he thinks that our systematics are ultimately going to reflect genealogy. And we're going to sort of throw out this important key feature thing. And eventually, not in my lifetime, we're going to see that happen. And he was very correct in that, I think, in the sense that that's what we've been trying to gain. But there was no necessary method that he could point to to get us there. There was instead a narrative and a chronology of events with an overlay of causation. The cause, natural selection. And you could always explain it. Well, this didn't sit so well with uh, a lot of systematists over time and other scientists. And so systematics really fell into disrepute by the end of, as a, a, a large scale endeavor, by the end of the 19th century. And the rise of genetics uh, and population thinking replaced it. And then it was reborn again. Now, why it took a century to make this next step, no one has ever, to my knowledge, has asked that question. And no one has therefore answered it. But why it took a century to make the next step in phylogenetic reasoning to begin to partition the problem in a way where you could argue a testable argument, I, I'm not exactly sure, but it took a century. In the meanwhile, what was impressive to Darwin, Heckel, and others was embryology. There was a lot of different things he brought in to the picture. But one of the things he didn't bring in in a real big way was the fossil record, because the fossil record was one of the difficulties. It um, was imperfect. And he spent a lot of time talking about that. Never uttered a word about dinosaurs. You know, the dinosaurs were quite popular in Darwin's day. 
He never even articulated by name and made a huge thing, although he was highly pleased by the discovery of Archaeopteryx, which happened a year or two after the complete specimen, a year or two after he published The Origin of Species. Fossils to him, it was difficult to predict. It's an historical contingency. It's difficult to predict where they're going to go. And when you look back in the freedom of not having a lot of fossils and try to make a prediction, you will inevitably be wrong. We've been wrong time and time again. Human origins, about the sequence of events in human origins, we were very wrong. But I think probably one man had more to do with his neglect of the fossil record in dinosaurs than anyone else, and it was probably Richard Owen. Richard Owen had invented the word dinosaur. He became Darwin's, one of Darwin's, uh, he was a pal originally when he was young, absolutely brilliant anatomist. If you pick up one of his comparative anatomy texts, the amount of anatomy that this man knew is unbelievable, but an ardent foe uh, of Darwin during his, his day after the publication of The Origin of Species. So what I'm going to do is just uh, show you a little bit about the origin of birds because this is what was found in Darwin's day, and Darwin did predict. He was so pleased with the discovery of Archaeopteryx because he predicted that one day we're going to find a bird whose digits are not fused. The thumb is free, but the rest of the digits are, uh, the two other digits are fused. And it came from that quarry in Solenhofen. This is the Berlin specimen, a London specimen, was found in 1861. And he was just dying to read all about it, getting news snippets, had teeth, so on. He didn't make much of it, though. He was pleased. It was Huxley who made a lot of it. Huxley found uh, a great similarity with another small bird-like dinosaur in the quarry and made the link to birds. A lot of the fossil record is sort of the contingency of when you find things. And we, for the last 15 years or so, have really been dominantly uh, of the idea that birds and dinosaurs are linked, really ever since the discovery of Deinonychus and, and re-attention to the problem uh, 20, 30 years ago. But it was really fossils from China that really blew it wide open with the discovery of feathers and feathered dinosaurs that you see here. This is another example of a feathered dinosaur. And um, in the same beds as feathered birds, slightly more advanced than Archaeopteryx. As a consolation, because I know some of you at least <laughs> were thinking you were going to come to the lab and see lots of different in things, I brought one of these birds. This is Confucius Ornus. Uh, it's the second oldest bird. It's 135 million years old. And you can see feather imprints on it. It comes from the famous dinosaur beds of China. We actually were the first to publish a bird from those beds. We had absolutely no idea what would follow with the discovery of feathered dinosaurs. But it's complete chance. Uh, these beds were known in the 1920s. They knew about the fish, the insects. Had they just found one feathered dinosaur, or for that matter, one bird, there would have been a run on the place. It was a horse ride out of Beijing. And the whole history of birds would have been different for the, for the 20th century. It would have grown up understanding that dinosaurs and birds really are linked anatomically. There's so much evidence now from so many different lines of reasoning put into a phylogenetic framework that it is pretty unshakable. And really, the gradation, the one gradation, invertebrate transformation from a land dwelling to an airborne animal that we can actually say we have really down quite well. Um, the others we don't know. Now, this is a modern rendition of this. And what the historians of science have said is that what has happened over time is that we have begun to separate out the chronology from the narrative. We still have five different explanations for why and how that transition occurred. They are limited and constrained by the chronology. But the chronology, we try as much as possible to leave separate from those causal explanations. This is the chronology of events spread out over time. Now, uh, it was mentioned Raptor X. We announced the Dinosaur Raptor X. And um, we are fantastically interested in narratives. And I used that interest to get a science publication. I'll admit it, baldly. <laughs> <laughs> we do this. The molecular people, often uh, scientists don't do that. I've done some molecular work. But basically, we are very interested in trajectories through time. We're interested in the characters that change and the origin of birds. This is narratives, just like, just like Darwin was. And, I, and here we had an ancestor 
almost perfectly an ancestor just like Archaeopteryx to the later radiation of huge predators that feature in all the films that dominated the last 25 million years on this continent and in Asia. And it's a punk. It's a tiny little thing, and it's got all the features of these big guys. And so the chronology now as to when those features arose and at what body sizes changed, uh, I did not create a narrative. I didn't say why. I came pretty close to it, but I didn't say why. Uh, but I know that that's why the paper got accepted, because it was the explanation in our mind of the origin of what happened later that drew so much attention to this little raptor rex. It was the Ur Tyrannosaur, and we know what happened in Tyrannosaur evolution. Was it related to the small arms, the lanky legs, the big head that we see at eight, nine feet? I can't say, and I wouldn't say, and I didn't say. But I know that's on the minds of people reading the paper. It's narrative that we're really interested in when we look at evolution even today. But we have to break down the chronology and separate it apart. This is the chronology. When events happened, when the anatomy happened. Now, this is the story that I'm going to spend uh, a little bit of the rest of the time trying to build. Published in Cladistics recently. I haven't been mauled over by the philosophers of science for stepping a little bit out of the field. But really, there's very little philosophy of phylogeny, what we used to do and what we do now. In fact, the literature is extremely thin. You have people talking about evolutionists, but almost nobody talking about phylogeny. You know, there's only one or two papers written about what we actually do in phylogeny from the moment we walk up to our desk and start scoring things, be they molecules or characters, how we actually go about doing that. What assumptions we make? There's a lot of theory about how you come up with a tree from a million base pairs or characters, but the actual procedures and what assumptions you make have not been diagrammed out. And what I'm going to talk about is that there's a long period crystallized in the origin of species in 1859 where uh, there was an evolutionary framework. A lot of terms were used and crystallized by Darwin and his contemporaries like Owen, homology, analogy, convergence, parallelism, and the whole analogy of the tree of life, the narrative of evolution was established at that point. But that it took about 100 years before one process began to break that down. There's only two processes, I think, that have been in effect since Darwin's day, when he talked about an evolutionary narrative to break it down into a testable scientific hypothesis. One I call atomization, where you take the things of evolution and you break them into their component parts. I call that atomization. And the other I call quantification. Once you've broken it into its component parts so we can analyze it, you look at it quantitatively. If we can't look at it quantitatively, it's very difficult to test. We need those two things. And I think it's happened in two periods. So what happened in 1950, actually, in German, and it took a while for it to translate into English, was the atomization of characters, a formalization of terms, so we could look at characters as an actual transformation of states. And so Hennig is the person with very few precursors, a few precursors, but he really put it together. It took the translation to English and uh, several acolytes before it spread rapidly. But, what, and I apologize, you may not be able to see too well the blue here. But characters were divided into plesiomorphic or primitive and apomorphic states. And he invented terms for combining some of these apomorphic states together. He atomized branching. He actually looked at a phylogenetic tree squarely and hard and said, OK, we have monophyletic groups, we have polyphyletic groups. We have these terms were not common in the literature previous to that. It took an entire century to realize that we could break down in terms both characters and trees. But what he didn't do, which is important and remarkable, is that he thought by breaking them down alone, we could solve the evolutionary problems. By simply studying them hard, we would come up with the right solution. And, and uh, that the issue of character conflict, that there's often characters that will lead you one way and characters that will lead you quite another way, was not addressed in any level of detail by anyone. This was not viewed as, as the main problem. But of course it was, because 
there was going to be an assessment of evidence, and you had to come up with some kind of a solution. Now, that wouldn't happen. So I, I think that's really the atomization of characters and cladograms. And I have each inside the other because it's not overturning an hypothesis. What it's doing is it's atomizing and quantifying the problem of phylogeny. That happened in 1950, although, as I said, there was a little bit of delay until it really uh, got to be widely appreciated. And about the same time, of course, here at the University of Chicago, Sokol and others, also upset with the unrigorous nature of, of phylogenetic narrative, said, let's just forget about phylogeny altogether. Let's just measure things. That was a quantitative approach, which generated a lot of techniques also for individuating morphology at the same time. Um, so methodological uh, rigor is happening. Now, at, at this point, in I'm going to depart from the quantitative uh, uh, the numerical uh, approach, uh, because I'm going to be concentrating on trying to estimate phylogeny. And the numerical approach was, let's, okay, let's forget about the phylogeny. We'll classify things how we can, how we can uh, uh, measure them. And so 1969, a uh, classic paper by Ferris and Kluge, 1969, quantitative phyletics of aneurysms, said, OK, well, if we have a character state that's primitive and a character state that's derived for a given character, then we can code this up into a matrix. I don't know how fully revolutionary they, they understood what they were writing about was. Probably Ferris understood it. He wrote another paper in 1970. And we were off to the races to try to quantify things. There were no computer programs at this point, no software, nothing. So those of us who were entering the field at the time, basically, um, were left to use mainframe computers if we used a computer at all. Most of us were just doing things by hand okay, for about 15 years until the software programs that we are familiar with. So let me go back. What we're talking about here is character states coded as mathematical variables. What they said is, if evolution is transformation from one state to another, we have a couple of assumptions. First assumption is that this character is independent of that character, because we're going to score them in the matrix. And the second assumption is that the character states are mutually exclusive. In other words, you can't have a red and a green structure if they are, in fact, parts of the same character, transforming from one state to another. Simple enough. But it wasn't really penetrating uh, the mind of a lot of systematists for the longest time. I can tell you that uh, because, well, sorry, let me go down the list here. Um, an index of character consistency was then possible. Now, this is parsimony. Okay, It was a, a very simple indis index of, of looking at the distribution of characters and working out the simplest solution on, on a branching diagram. And um, these are the two assumptions about character. And then, rapidly, a series of methods for combining results and ambiguous results and all sorts of other things, a posteriori methods for examining what is happening on your tree, your resultant tree from the data, emerged in the years that follow. Now, um, that is uh, the state that we have been in ever since. And we have dozens of methods now and dozens of optimality criteria. Not dozens, half a dozen optimality criteria, statistical ways of approaching uh, molecular data and approaching morphologic data. And we have lots of things that would fall into the category of what has been called data exploration. There are ways to manipulate data in the output of a tree. And I think that where we are with morphology is in a very tough spot now. And uh, I'm going to try and describe where I think the field is going. But first, I want to describe what it's like to work with morphology. Um, I showed you already an origin of the birds sort of phylogeny. That's one kind of analysis that we do. It might I call it a lineage type of analysis. To do a lineage analysis, you have to break down these big side groups into either exemplars or subsume them into higher order groups. When you do that, then the resulting morphology that you're looking at, it can be hundreds of characters, really tell you about the origin of a group or tell you about the direction through phylogeny. With molecules, we tend not to do that because you sample at the individual level. You can take an exemplar if you want. But generally, we sample at the individual level. 
And seeing a higher order relationship is, is not typically what you do, or you could combine them. But this is not, because we're not usually looking at the relationships, we're not looking at the change of the molecule along the stem here. We just do the whole thing, including, perhaps, all of life at the genomic level. This is not something that we would do with phylogeny because, with morphology, because a lot of times the morphology becomes rather meaningless as you move out. That's one kind of analysis that we do. Another kind is the basal radiation. We subsume these groups down. Another one might be uh, a monophyletic group, and so on. And what we have in the, in, the, in the systematic literature are all these analyses, literally hundreds of analyses, that partially overlap. And we have a very difficult time comparing them, or actually even finding the data that is relevant in these various phylogenies. It's looking at phylogeny like this. It's a fractal thing for morphologists. We can pull out, we can go back down in, we can subsume a group, we can look at a lineage, but in the end, we end up with these analyses that are very difficult to compare. I never thought we'd quite be in this, relate, in this situation right now. The only way to get a larger scale phylogeny is to give up on the comparisons of the actual data level and create a super tree, which is some sort of patchwork combination but not really a comparison at the data level to bring things together. Very difficult, much easier to do uh, in a genome analysis across or a particular or concatenated series of genes across a much larger phylogeny. And this problem has been known for a long time, about 20, 20 years or so. It's been called the Bet Noir in 1990. We've replaced the old evolutionary systematics with a new black box, which is the matrix. And attached to every phylogeny, including the Raptor X paper, is yet another matrix. How it relates to the previous matrices is not clear. Sometimes you'll have general statements about what you included or not. Sometimes you'll talk about the last analysis that you yourself generated. But how it relates to anything else in a global sense, in a mathematical or quantitative sense, is unknown. And when you go and actually search the data, what a big problem it is. You have to get out the papers and do it by hand. And I think that's really the situation where we're in now. We're searching. It's almost as though we're at a point like we were, to my opinion, where we're at a point where we were in the 19th century, where we had exhausted our use of narrative. And we're searching for a methodology. It just doesn't do any good when you can produce a new matrix and a new matrix and have a very difficult time understanding exactly why you're getting a difference from a previous matrix without any way of actually comparing. So I think what we're going to do in the next 10 years is search for ways. Morphology is very important. It's important for plotting onto diagrams, even if all you're doing is plotting the morphology onto a molecular diagram. But of course, for much of the fossil record, including the part I work on, that's all we have. And so it, it's important to try to figure out new methods for moving ahead. And um, you know, there's differences between these phylogenies in the case of Molecular taxa also have, molecular analyses have some of these, but terminal taxa, the ancestral condition, the algorithms and assumptions, those are the easy ones to sort of compare. These are the harder ones, character coding, character selection, character state scores. And so there's really two problems, two main problems. Characters, what are they? And can we come to some agreement over what they are and somehow reduce the mayhem at the data level that exists in morphology? Because if not, then we have a real issue. And then somehow we have to grapple with comparative analysis of data in a better way than we're doing now. We can't be doing it by hand. There's already hundreds and thousands of characters among bird-like dinosaurs, for example. We have to be able to do it so that the computer can recognize the same character from analysis to analysis. That's where we're going. We have to be going in that direction. Okay. And so first I went into the literature to figure out what a character was. And you probably can't read that. Um, <laughs> you don't need to read it. There was no agreement on what a character was. In fact, still alive in the literature today is the idea that a character and a character state are really the same thing. Really, character states are just present, absent conditions. And there's no, no such thing as a character. And some people would say, no, 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 no. There is such a thing as a character. It's a variable. And the states are mutually exclusive options of, optional states of that character, which is what I believe. And, there are some, and there's no agreement on coding. The number of methods for coding characters is very multiplied. And so after studying the literature and studying what people create as characters, 
I found um, that these are still the only two precepts that we never took Kluge and Ferris um, at face value. These, I think, are the only two precepts that we operate with. That the characters, that we can weight them in different ways, we can do, you know, but our main assumption is that when you have a character, it's going to operate independently from other characters. It's one assumption that mutually exclusive states are the conditions of those characters. What I found was that all the language, the rich text that make up characters are divisible into four components, only one of which had been named uh, the character states. And so um, this is a typical line of data from morphology, from a morpho morphological matrix where you'd be scoring taxa. I'm calling this part the character. We didn't actually decide this in the literature, believe it or not. Some people would refer to this whole thing as the character. I'm calling this the statement. I'm calling this whole thing the character statement. So here's something that reads a bone, a process, its length, shorter and longer than something else. I'm calling the whole thing a character statement. There's a character. There's variable conditions. They're testable. You can go in and measure them and decide whether they're present or not. And I've only found two types of characters. So one I've called neomorphic, in which something appears or disappears. And you don't see it, or you see it. And there's no precursor condition that you can really ally with it. And the other is an actual transformation, a change form, where something is blue, and then it's red, it's long, and then it's short. There's a gray zone in between. But basically, those are the two kinds of, and I think there's things that, sorry, things that we point at, I call them locators. And there's general locators to get us to the specific locators, but eventually you're gonna get down to the very specific thing that you're pointing at, and that's the primary locator. And if it's a transformational character, you may not have stated the variable, but all you've done by not stating the variable is added work to the person who's looking at the character. If you're talking about length, and you just said long and short, and you didn't put length in there. That's, of course, what happens in the literature. There is an etiquette in a language that is as structured as Chomsky and grammar to characters. We have not realized it. We have not named the components. But that's how structured it is. And when you see, so, but of course, if you don't realize that, and you don't have any rules of grammar whatsoever, if you have a condition that's variable, and you have no responsibility to put the variable there. It's like having a sentence without a subject. But logically, you need a variable if you have variable conditions so that you're, you're, the person interpreting your data knows what you're talking about. Then, of course, you can have many, many versions of the exact same thing. And that's what we have in the literature. Some of them you'd have to view as incomplete statements like this. I'll just give one very simple example. Sepal, five, six, eight. I found this in the literature. Well, they're actually talking about sepal number. They're not talking about sepal present absent. They're talking about sepal number. And they should indicate that. That's a complete sentence that you can go into another matrix and actually find. And we should have a pull down menu that in indicates what a sepal is. And then if you want to put a variable condition that is a mutually exclusive condition, because you can't have five and six and eight at the same time, that's reasonable then you, you construct your character that way, and the computer can recognize it. You're allowed to construct it that way so that we can ultimately produce something like this in a coordinated way and actually compare. Now, uh, so that's the character, but this was a, the correct solution. No molecular biologist has ever posed it. This is the correct solution to dinosaur phylogeny. <laughs> um, but I, I want to now compare this phylogeny to somebody else. Let's say we've all agreed now on the characters, and there is a movement for character ontologies, controlled vocabularies, and really working out what characters are and how they're structured. There is a movement to do this now. And I think that is going to be the next wave, where we actually have pull-down menus to identify the anatomy in structured ways so that computers can find the same information in another cladogram. Now we have the second part of the problem, which is actually making a comparison to another phylogeny. Not as easy as simply lining up a gene if you have the alignment correct and letting it roar. Okay, And so this is where we come to the literature of what have we been doing since Darwin uh, in terms of phylogeny. Um, this is a paper written actually by a co-student of mine, 1986, that talks about sort of the analysis of characters and then the analysis of the phylogeny itself. 
a two-part procedure. If you make it a little bit more understandable, there's character analysis, and then we move to clustering or parsimony algorithms or something, and we produce a cladogram. That's what we think we do. There's only been one other diagram that I've been able to find uh, in the literature. Two or th well, there's two or so. They're pretty much the same. Now, I, I sort of think that this is what we're going to be doing in the next decade. We will start with data compilation. And this is getting more sophisticated. So we are using images. We're using video. We're using all sorts of things attached to cells in the matrix, which is going to help identify things. And I believe we're going to be using controlled vocabularies and pull down menus to construct this data. Then we're going to go to phylogenetic computation, but we may do something else as well. We can go to phylogenetic composition and then go to the standard tree-focused output. But the next phase is going to be interested in data-focused output. So I think we're going to be interested in what the data are saying and how the data compare to other phylogenies. Right now, we don't do that except occasionally by hand. I don't like this person's character. I don't like that character. We have no indices, no ways of quantitatively comparing cladograms. Why? Because the cladogram is over here, and it overlaps a portion with the cladogram over there, and someone's doing a lineage analysis over here, and the tax aren't the same, and the characters aren't the same, and they're not coded, and it's a nightmare to try and find out the same problem to make a comparison. But we have to find the portion of the problem that overlaps if we're ever going to do data comparison in morphology. So the last two or three slides, this, I just want to show you, we don't do this now extensively, data characterization. This is asking, where are the characters? When did they accumulate? Who created them? Where are we going with this problem? Is it an incomplete problem, or are we actually accumulating data to the point where we're running out of data? You know, the skeleton has limited amounts of data if you're looking at the skeleton. So these are some of the things that are very easy to record. Who created the data first over time? This is one of my phylogenies, the accumulation of data in the fossil record. Um, we can actually see how data is accumulating for a particular problem. But this is the more troubling one, which is to try and create comparisons. And so for that, you ultimately need to take two hypotheses that may have different taxa, they may have overlapping taxa, and they may have comparable taxa. And you have to find the core problem that is the same. This at least is the theoretical approach that I've taken and described. You have to find the core problem that's the same. Otherwise, you can't make a comparison. You have no index, no way to create an index. And so if somebody has studied a particular group and incorporated 50 taxa on the outside, you have to remove those 50 taxa and look at the relevant data in the part of the problem that overlaps. And I describe procedures how to do that. If you do, then you've created the same problem. I call it the shared taxonomic scope. Then you can look at the amount of data and see if it's shared or if there's novel data in each data matrix. And you can calculate similarities. For shared data, that is the same characters for the same problem or comparable taxa, you can see first how many characters were used in common. And then you can see how those common characters were actually scored. This is the nitty gritty of comparison. This is where we have to go if we're going to be a scientific discipline. Why? Because if we cannot tell another scientist why our phylogeny differs from yours, we are replicating the problem that we had with phylogeny in the 19th century. We may have created phylogeny. We may have created the verbiage and the whole discipline of phylogeny that the molecularists are running away with. But we ourselves have to become rigorous again in making these comparisons. Otherwise, we will fall prey to the critique that is out there right now, which is that it's arbitrary and we cannot make these comparisons. So what I've done is set up a series of indices to do that. I take Tyrannosaurus as an example. I took a very, I'm going through some examples. Four phylogenies. I compare them all. First, I figure out where the data came from. I equalized them, and I made a comparison. So above here is, is how much character similarity there is, and in the characters that actually are similar, how similar are they scored? I had to create a whole new terminology because such does not exist. We have a zero versus a one, a zero versus a question mark. We don't have a terminology for these differences because no one is making these comparisons yet. But we will because we do need to know how 
the ultimate question is for why, why are cladograms different? And of course, the shocking and surprising result, which maybe is not that surprising, if you are not making these comparisons, you will be very surprised at the amount of difference there is. Whole amounts of like 40 and 50% of the characters used in phylogenies dealing with the same group are different. And among those characters that are the same, the number of scores that are different are staggering. And you can make an index that's a very simple index, just like the consistency index, to actually cover these. Here's one by the same author, 10% difference. Can you imagine if you sequence the gene and one out of 10 base pairs was wrong or different from somebody else? This would be considered, of course, unacceptable. But of course, it gets much higher than that. Here's somebody versus somebody else for shared characters. That's 30% difference in what I deem to be, and I think are, the same characters. And here's the overlap between this author and this author in the amount of used characters for Tyrannosaurus phylogeny, 20%. So 80% of the data is different. See, we can't continue to operate like this ultimately if we want to be scientific and answer these types of questions. How much overlap is there between opposing phylogenetic studies? You know, a second series of questions, level two, character statement questions. Is character selection responsible for conflicting results? Is it because you're using different characters than mine? Simple enough question. You can answer it with a number. Or the third level question, how similar are the character state scores for shared characters? Are differing character state scores responsible for conflicting results? You can actually push a button and swap scores and see what happens. You can push a button and equalize scores. Just cancel the ones that differ to see if that's the reason for why you're getting a different result. But ultimately, morphology is important. I believe we are going to go there. And I think that there'll be programs that will bring up two phylogenies, maybe three, but certainly two phylogenies rather than just one. We have to go there. It is, I think, the next phase. And what is it that I just described to you? Atomization of characters into their parts, quantification of comparison. Same two things that have been happening for the last century and a half. Um, it's painful, um, but somebody needs to do the programming. Um, finally, I just want to say that there's through one compensatory dinosaur image in there that it was talked about a little bit by the last speaker, but I'll leave you with this last thought for those that are teachers and those that are students, that it is an important thing, but often forgotten, that Darwin was a mediocre student bad student. <laughs> you know, his father considered him a failure, as fathers often do. He went to study, didn't like medicine, didn't like dissection, thought geology was boring, would never read a geology book. Then he went to study, you know, to become a, a, a priest in the church, found that to be horrible, thought it was a complete waste of time. As the last speaker pointed out, he was in his 20s when he lucked into the Beagle thing. He was natural, he was curious, he was learning in out of school time, something that we have to bring to bear in the next decades here in the United States. So I just leave you with this, that genius can be born at any point out of medi mediocrity. And that should be really something that you should tell your students. I'm sure the opposite is true too. You can be a stellar student <laughs> and be a mediocre scholar. But don't fail to mention that at any point in time, you can pick up the reins and do something creative. Thank you very much.